Alan, thank you for coming this far. Oh, Dane, it's a, it's a real pleasure. And uh, you're, you're particularly important to this cause because of your background, your credentials. So again, for the benefit of, of this interview, your military experience, if you can outline that very briefly, and then your fishing game experience. Okay, I was a uh, trained weather observer in the United States Air Force. I did a full four years of, of service and uh, mostly cloud identification uh, as an observer. And uh, after I got out of the service, I went, to, of course, I went back to school. I was going to take meteorology to go into that and hit a biology class. And so that took me uh, up to Humboldt State where I got a degree in wildlife management. And after I got my degree, I got hired by the California Department. Of, it was Department of Fish and Game in those days. And now it's the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I did that job for 38 plus years. 38 years. 38 fish years. And yeah. So your, your credentials are particularly appropriate to address the geoengineering issue. Because one, you have this meteorological background, so you recognize what we see in the sky is anything but natural, correct? Oh, and the, and, yeah. And then you see firsthand the cataclysm that's occurring on the ground, correct? Yeah, I found it an interesting combination. It's, it's the ideal combination for this. Yeah. That's why you're so oh. important to this cause. But the, on, on the effect on the ground, you're seeing it kill off this contaminant, this bioavailable metal. It's killing soil microbes, yes? Yes. Yes, and so, and, and when soil microbes are taken out of the, uh, the ecosystem, then negative well, elements ensue, correct? Fungal yeah. elements ensue. Well, when you, when you change your microbial uh, composition, you change all the other species up the food chain that, that acted and relied on them. A bottom-up And so equation. it's a bottom-up. And so you've changed the entire ecosystem doing that. Um, if other microbes invade, which they could because I don't know the full range of microbes and which ones are, well, some of them actually eat aluminum. So those but might working, increase, but... But that's, that's something that might be one way to mitigate our situation. I know that there's, there's some that I think you've worked on that actually can perhaps be a benefit to us in getting this metal out of the soils as well, I think, right? Oh, yeah, you're right. So. Um, the microbial toolkit is so big, we have microbes that'll do everything. They'll eat everything, including nuclear radiation. But we need to, we need to stop this ongoing contamination in order to really uh, start to be able to mitigate Correct. So if, if this, as we see the beneficial microbes, toxic, or toxified, poisoned, if you will, and we see fungal elements ensue, in fact, uh, the species extinction rate right now being 200 plus a day of plant and animal, uh, statistically 70 to 80 percent of that is fungally related. So this would correlate, yes, if we know yes. we have this bioavailable well, metal, yeah, killing absolutely. the beneficial microbes. Absolutely. And, and on the, in the last, say, decade and a half, given the overall ecosystem health on a scale of one to 10, what would you say the decline would be in say the last decade and a half, 15 years? I think we're uh, pretty much up to an eight in, in overall impact and which including- is, which, which is cataclysmic and that oh, amount of time is cataclysmic. It's yes. cataclysmic. So, and, and now it's, it's taken this long for someone with your credentials, your background, former military meteorologist, 38 year fish and game biologist, it's taken how long before people really start to listen to what you're saying an expert? Because a lot of people don't have your courage, frankly. And this is, this is why I hold you in such high regard. So many people that have your background don't want to be bothered. They don't, they don't want to be seen as a standing up for this kind of a cause. Maybe they're afraid it'll affect their retirement or whatever they, they fear. But you've shown tremendous courage, for which I salute you. Any colleagues, any former uh, work uh, friends that are, have shown any interest in speaking out on this issue? Very few, very few. Um, I was hoping that a whole lot more folks would come out with what's really going on and what they're seeing. You know, it took a while to sort through all of the information about what's really going on. Um, you know, when I first started uh, seeing the, uh, the chemtrails, I just saw jet clouds being made. They weren't contrails. So it was obvious to me that they weren't contrails. Did you recognize that, it immediately? Oh, immediately. Yeah, I go, yeah. well, what the hell's going on? Yeah. When I started looking at the aircraft and found out they were all unmarked, flying grid patterns, doing turnarounds, it was real obvious to me that it was a controlled program. And so, I mean, even something so obvious, 
we're told by these official agencies just to trust us. Don't rely on your sense of reason. Don't rely on what you can see with your own eyes. Trust us. There's nothing going most, on. Most of these people report upstream. Yeah. You have supervisors exactly. who report to supervisors. They can ignore you. Or, in fact, I don't know of any that carried anything I said further up the line. Yeah, it stops. E e and even with the boss. Because uh, when my immediate supervisor didn't respond, I went higher. And in fact, I went to the, see the congressional folks to see what was going on. Somebody had to know because I'm seeing uh, aircraft flying through both civilian and military airspace. They have to be either military or military contractors or yes. some sort of arrangement. Yes. So, and no, they didn't know anything. And I found out later, well, yes, they did because most of them sat in on Kucinich's Space Act meetings, they knew about it, and they knew that, that chemtrails and, and harp combination were weather modifiers. So they had to put some kind of two and two together. But they weren't willing to carry this out in the nobody, open at all. Nobody that I know of was willing to carry it. So it's up to us citizen scientists and, and publics to do something about it. And this is where I spoke to a fish and game biologist that's currently employed two weeks ago, and she made it clear that any time she tries to shine any light on this contamination issue, the, the hammer gets lowered on her immediately. She's, oh yeah, she's it's, told to just yeah, uh, it's shut down. Shut up. Yeah, and a whole lot of the college folks that have been noticing this, they have, they're concerned about tenure and and exactly. funding, exactly. and most of the funding comes from the, a lot of the funding comes from the federal government, and yes. ultimately boy, they have shut down a lot of people who came forward with this and then wouldn't yeah. stop. The ultimately, you want to keep your job? <laughs> yes, and ultimately it appears even state funding comes from the federal government because we see a thirty, forty billion dollar state deficit that seems to disappear every year. Yeah. Those trails lead back to the central banks, so they fund everything down the line, and thus they can control everyone in that chain. Everyone. And I, I, there's a scientist from Duke University uh, that's also part of this funding problem. She's tried to bring up this issue. She's been taken into a room twice and told that if you continue to address this issue, there'll be consequences. What does that mean? So, uh, as you correctly stated, there's been a, a huge effort put in place to basically control everybody's opinion everybody's ability to uh, address any issues, and it all leads back to who controls the money, yeah. correct? It always does. And it's, it's very disconcerting to be able to see something you know is happening and to let people know and then have them basically laugh in your face. Well, I you think know, the laughing is starting to taper they off. Don't, well, our, our, thanks to you standing up today and, and this issue is being addressed. And now, wouldn't, would you say that the damage in the environment right now is so cataclysmic, this is my opinion certainly, as well, it's so catastrophic that there will be no hiding this much longer. Well, you, they can't it's, hide it, it now. That's my And I think too. this, this uh, hearing is testimony to that. Yeah, yes, I would agree. Yeah. If we had more people like you, we would certainly have had this out in the open already. Based on the current trajectory that you see, the current rate of decimation, would you say that if we stay on this path, we are absolutely going to hit the wall very soon. The biosphere will implode to a degree that is, um, will be a, a, a massive extinction event, which we believe statistically already exists. But if we stay on this path right now, it's the end of the road, is it not? Uh, it would be if, 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 it, we stay if, it's carried, if, if it's carried that far. If we stay on this path. Yeah. And that's our conclusion as well, that statistically, mathematically. If we had, again, more people that have, that have showed your courage, I don't think we'd be in this mess. So my, my utmost gratitude toward you, Alan. Oh. And uh, this and is Alan Buckman, former military meteorologist, 38-year fishing game biologist. Thank you, Alan. Thank, Thank you, you very Dean, much. for all the work you've Thank done. You.